your brick and mortar Bibles here with you tonight. Um, we're going to be in the book of Nahum. Um, if you guys are following along in the U version, um, go ahead and you can, if you don't know exactly where to find our stuff when we talk about it, um, if you have the U version app and you go to the menu and then you click on events, um, then it says catalyst. And so you can go there and the scripture is there and some of the um, notes that you can follow along with, as well as announcements and stuff. Um, but we're going to be in Nahum tonight, but I first got to talk to you guys. So I talk about movies a lot. I watch a lot of movies. I like movies, and I like a really good action movie. Um, I like a movie that has a good justice story. And I have a feeling a lot of people do. That's part of why the Marvel Universe is so popular, because um, these are great justice stories, right? Like the good guy and the bad guy are at odds, and the bad guy gets caught, and justice is served. It may take more than one movie to flow that through um, and to follow that story, but, but it happens. But where are the people who like horror movies? Where are you at? Raise your hands. Nice and proud. You guys are weird. You're so weird. But see, the horror movie is the exact opposite right? Because part of what makes them so scary is that there isn't really any justice, right? Because you have like this scary thing, and sometimes you may think that it's dead, and then surprise, at the end of the movie, it's not dead, and it's still coming after you, right? Or there's this unknown factor, this unresolved factor, where this like, this villain or this dark, secret, creepy thing that's coming after people, that's bringing all of this terror and all of this horror, it's still there. It hasn't gone away. It hasn't been dealt with. Justice hasn't been meted out. And I kind of think that the story here in Nahum, which is addressing the Ninevites, is kind of a horror story for the people of Israel, right? Because the behavior of the Assyrians was brutal enough to make a pretty incredible horror film, I think. Um, and the sermon tonight is titled, Another One Bites the Dust. Have you guys heard the Queen song playing just before we got started? It's going to be stuck in your head all night long. You're welcome. It's a good song. Um, so Nahum um, writes about the city of Nineveh, which was the capital at the time of Assyria. Um, and we're going to be talking about how this city bites the dust. So let's look back a little bit um, at some context so that you guys have a little bit of background going into this as we kind of dip our toes into this entire book. See, the Old Testament is filled with stories about the oppression of God's people and their deliverance. But I want to look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, and read this verse with you real quickly. It says, and God is promising Abram, he says, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now that blessing that's promised is Jesus right? Um, but the, the part here that I think is so applicable to Nahum is he says, those who bless you, like, I'll bless, but those who curse you, I'll curse. And so we're kind of seeing, like, the justice part of the story for the Ninevites here. Many world powers bit the dust under the heavy hand of God's judgment. Now, the Ninevites, you're probably familiar with them because Jonah also was a prophet to them, not necessarily willing. Nahum was a lot more willing, um, complained a lot less that we can see. Um, but this was about 140 years prior to the book of Nahum. Um, so initially, like when Jonah went, they repented. But then obviously it was a pretty short-lived repentance because they went back to their sin. And this prophet is addressing them again. Um, then the fulfillment of this prophecy comes about 40 or 50 years later. Truthfully, not only were the Ninevites warned, but we see that God has the same message even for his own people. He warns them as well in other texts about the consequences of their sin. But the difference here is that where, a, a, where repentance is, grace and mercy are found, right? Um, God, he blessed the Ninevites for a time. He refrained from his judgment because of their repentance, but they went back to their sin. Therefore, justice was going to have to come, right? And the Israelites, though they did sin, they kept coming back to God. We need to have, and they needed to have, a legacy of faith um, and repentance, but instead the Ninevites chose a legacy of violence. Therefore, they were going to face God's judgment. Now, if you want to dig into other texts in the Old Testament to grab a little bit more context than we have time for tonight, um, in 2 Kings chapter 17 through 23, and also 2 Chronicles 32 through 34, you can kind of see some of the other landscape a little bit closer and more specifically of what's going on um, with God's people and not necessarily just in Nineveh. But Nineveh, like I said, was the capital at the time of Assyria. There had been three different capitals of Assyria, but at this time it was Nineveh. And Nahum is prophesying while Assyria is still at the height of their power. 
Um, so it was the worst message at the worst time. It seemed the least likely to be possible. Um, one of my favorite commentary books, it's this book called um, How to Read the Bible, Book by Book. Um, and Stuart and Fee, they said, during this time, the kings of Judah were vassals of Assyria. So this prophecy was politically incorrect in every way. And this book that seemed to be politically incorrect at the time is where we're going to camp out tonight. And the first thing that I want you guys to see before we jump into this text and to keep in mind as we're reading is that God is serious. He's not a God that makes empty threats. So I find, like, as a mom and as a parent, now that I'm looking at things a little bit differently, that parents tend to camp out in, like, one of two character categories, mostly. So there's the parents who make empty threats, or some, raise your hands, you got some of the parents that, like, said they were going to follow through on the concept, no, you guys, your parents were of swift justice, like, you don't obey, like, the hammer's coming down, okay, cool. Well, so, but here's the thing. I don't like to discipline my children. I don't enjoy disciplining my children. I love my girls. And when I see the panic on their face, when they know that discipline is coming, um, whatever that discipline may look like, it breaks my heart because they are my flesh and blood, right? Like, I love them more than they can possibly ever fathom. And it's a true story. I love them more than they could ever possibly love me because, like, the love that a parent has for their child is beyond logic and description. That's why we're crazy parents. Um, but the thing is, if I want to be a good parent, I cannot withhold the consequences of the misbehavior from my children. But here's the thing. I want to give my daughters as much opportunity as possible to make the right choice. I don't want to punish them, but if they don't make the right choice, eventually the consequences will follow. The justice will follow, depending on the misbehavior, sometimes quicker than others. Um, but the consequences will follow. But the reason for the patience is, because, is not because I'm tolerating my children's bad behavior, but it's because I love them and I want to see them make the right choice. Or in this situation, like God's patience with the Ninevites, to see them make the right choice and to repent. His patience isn't because God was tolerant of their evilness. It's because of the love of people that he had created and a desire for them to make the right choice. So let's read in Nahum chapter 1. We're going to start at the beginning and go down. Um, if you're reading in your hard Bible, I'm going to jump a lot. It might be a little obnoxious. I apologize. Try to keep up. We can't read all three chapters tonight. It begins, an oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in the whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all of the rivers. And then down into verse 6, who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries. I want to repeat that again. He will make a complete end of the adversaries, and he will pursue his enemies into darkness. And then down to verse 12, thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength and many, they will be cut down and pass away. And remember when I said that Nahum is coming with the most politically inaccurate message at the time, because they were at the height of their power. They seemed daunting and completely undefeatable. And God is saying, though they are at full strength and many, they will be cut down and pass away. So I want to tell you a little bit about my dad. I'm a Navy brat, like, traveled all the time. So that meant that my dad, by default, was a gym rat. Um, and when he was out to sea um, on the aircraft carriers and stuff, he had a lot of free time. So we spent a lot of time pumping iron. Um, and when my dad maxed out, when he was competing with a much younger guy at the ship that thought he could best him, uh, my dad was benching 420 pounds. So he was kind of like an intensely strong dude. Um, so I knew that nobody was going to mess with me because... My dad was beastly, right? Um, and I also knew that I was not at the wrong end of his wrath. I knew that he was the one that was going to protect me. So I didn't need to fear him, but I knew that anyone that messed with me needed to be afraid of him, right? He may only be 5'8", but he is a powerhouse. 
we see that God is the same way. Now, I also want to talk a little bit about why they deserved God's wrath. Because as we're talking about the wrath of God, it might be tempting for us to feel bad for the Ninevites. Um, because this book is actually a pretty brutal and pretty graphic book. If it was going to be turned into a movie, it would definitely be R for all the gore and the violence. Um, but there's a lot of things that they were guilty of, and so I want to go through those things really quickly with you. First of all, idolatry matters to God. We see in another passage in scripture with another prophet, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or praise to idols. And the Ninevites and the Assyrians were guilty of this. But here's another thing. Oppression matters to God. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 31 says, he who oppresses the poor taunts his maker. But he who is gracious to the needy honors him. And that's kind of intense to think about your oppression of the poor being a taunt to the almighty God, the one that made everything. Cruelty matters to God. Psalm chapter 12, verse 5. Because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. Injustice matters to God. See, these themes are all throughout the Old and in the New Testament, in all of the books right? It's in the history, it's in the law, it's in the prophets, and the gospels, and the letters. I don't have time to go through all of those places, but it's everywhere because it's this theme that shows us that this is something that's very important to the heart of God. Therefore, it must be important to us. But in the book of Nahum here, the warning is for the Assyrians and Nineveh. But at the same time, just like with my dad and how he was intense, the warning was for those that would come against me. But the comfort is for God's people. So we see both themes coming up here, because depending on what side of this you're on, this is a message of either comfort or horror. So we talked about how God is serious, right? God doesn't make meaningless and empty threats. He means what he says, and he says what he means. And so if it's something that's written in Scripture, we need to take notice and pay attention to the things that God says. But we also see that God is sovereign, there has never been a moment that God was not in control and that he has not heard the cries of his people or the oppression of his people. We're going to read some verses in Nahum chapter 2 as well as in chapter 3. But while we're reading these, I want you to kind of play in your mind because this is a song, right? It's a really violent, brutal song that you wouldn't exactly sing to your kids at night during this time period because they'd have nightmares. But I want you to picture in your mind the graphic imagery that's being described here. So in chapter 2, starting with verse 4, the chariots race madly through the streets. They rush to and fro through the square. They gleam like torches. They dart like lightning. And then down to verse 10, desolate, desolation and ruin. Hearts melt and knees tremble. Anguish is in all the loins. All faces grow pale. Remember, we're talking about one of the mightiest armies, one of the most brutal people in the capital of this nation, that the world had really ever seen at that point. And God is telling his prophet Nahum to say, their hearts are going to melt, their knees are going to tremble. Then down to verse 13, it says, Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. Man, what a terrifying statement. And I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. So they're warriors even. Like the pride that they have, the fiercest that they have. He will devour with the sword. He will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of the messengers shall no longer be heard. Chapter 3, verse 1. Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder. No end to the prey, the crack of the whip, and the rumble of the wheel, galloping horses and bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear, hosts of slain. Heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over the bodies. Can you just imagine this? I mean, you've seen in the movies sometimes when there's this epic battle and they're having to like climb over the bodies of the dead in order to continue the, bottle, the, the battle. And that's what is written here. That's what it's saying here. Verse five, behold, I am against you. Man, if God repeats himself in scripture, we need to take extra notice. So he is extra against the Ninevites declares the Lord of hosts. And I will lift up your skirts over your face and I will make nations look at your nakedness and kingdoms at your shame. I will throw filth at you and treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. And all who look at you will shrink from you and say, wasted is Nineveh. 
Who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? See, no one liked them because they were jerks. They were evil, horrific, violent people. They had no one that was a fan of them. So when this destruction was going to come, everybody was going to celebrate it. Everyone was going to be relieved and also want nothing to do with them. No one was going to come to their defense. Down to verse 19. It says, there is no easing your hurt. Your wound is grievous. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you so they're celebrating with joy over the fact that Nineveh is dying. For upon whom has not come your unceasing evil? Man, God's saying here, you have been horrific to everyone, and I have not turned a blind eye. His patience with them has not been because he was apathetic or didn't care. God is sovereign. He is always in control. His patience cannot be mistaken for tolerance. He wanted the people to repent, but because of their continued rejection of him and their continued defiance of the things that mattered to God, destruction was inevitable. It's a vivid description of the carnage of battle, a violent song of judgment. But I want you guys to catch this, right? Because it is a culture of warriors. It is a city of warriors, a nation of warriors, and they are about to come up against the greatest warrior See, God is a mighty warrior. Now, when I was kind of thinking about the best way to kind of describe the Ninevites, I was talking to Kyla, and we were talking a little bit Lord of the Rings, and I think of them kind of like the Orakai. Um, the Ninevites are like super brutal, super nasty, like there's no like peace. So when I read this, I kind of like picture them like the Orakai. I know. Um, and then when I'm thinking of the, wi- the mighty warriors that I can think of in movies, again, right, um, Mel Gibson and Braveheart, and also in The Patriot, um, Russell Crowe, Gerard Butler. Like, you think of, like, all of these epic battle scenes in these movies that they're in, and they're, like, jumping off of the bodies and, like, flying slow motion, like, through the air, and, like, these, like, crazy battle cries and, like, inspiring all of the people. God is so far beyond that that he makes them look like pansies. And I'm a huge fan of those guys, so to say that, you know that I'm obviously an even much bigger fan of God, and I'm trying to tell you that he is such a great warrior that these guys to him are nothing. And even a battle of orkai like evil dudes are nothing in the face of this mighty sovereign God, this mighty warrior. See, but it can be uncomfortable, right? Because we like to talk about the comfortable, good, loving, gracious aspects of God. The God that wants to give us a hug and wants to wipe the tears off our face. And the God that's empathetic. And that's great because he is all of those things, right? That's part of the beauty of God. He is 100% those things as well as these things without any compromise. He's those completely, but he's also completely just. Stuart and Fee again say, Nahum reminds us of the essential character of the God whose goodness and salvation stand side by side his justice and judgment. The same is with the death of Jesus on the cross. So when we look at Jesus on the cross, we both see the justice and the judgment of God met with the grace and the mercy of God simultaneously, right? So God is serious and he is sovereign and the sin of Nineveh would no longer go unpunished. And their decimation is going to come a few decades after this prophecy. The mighty warrior, the sovereign God, would wield the Babylonians and the Medes as weapons against them around 612 B.C. And can you imagine this God that's so mighty that he can use and wield these people as weapons against the Syrians to vanquish them? It would be so severe. I want you guys to catch this because when I saw this, I was like, surely that's not accurate. And it was in like all of the commentaries that I read. Their decimation, their obliteration was going to be so severe that Nineveh was not rediscovered again in its ruins until the 19th century, like 2,000 years later. So when I say another one bites the dust, they bit the dust and were buried. And it wasn't discovered until like, the 19th century. It's crazy. Like, it blows my mind that it was buried for this long. This violent people were going to come face to face with an even more violent God. And I don't mean that in evil, right? But I mean that it's this powerful justice and this violence because he was going to deal with them for their disobedience and for their sinful behavior. One of my favorite commentators, David Guzik, says, Nineveh was ripe for a devastating judgment. This was not a harsh chastening. This was utter destruction to come upon the city. 
They may have been a mighty people that rarely experienced defeat, but they were about to face the wrath of the most mighty God that never experienced defeat. God won't allow the evil empires of the world to reign forever. The Bible Project video stated that, and then they go on to say, trust and hit that in his time, he will bring down the impressors of every time and every place. I want to say those two lines from the Bible Project video again, because when I heard that, I mean, it just like, it rocked me, because the truth of it is so powerful. Because sometimes we can get really intimidated by the things that are happening on a global landscape, right? And we can feel really small and insignificant because there's a lot of big things to be afraid of. But that's the thing. The world hasn't changed. There's always been a lot of big things to be afraid of. But we serve a God that's the mighty warrior, so there's no need for us to find our security in the world and the things it has to offer. We find our security in the great warrior God. So again, the quote was, God won't allow the violent empires of the world to reign forever. Trust that in his time, he will bring down the oppressors of every time and every place. So you might be thinking, but that was then. So what does this mean for me? I'm not a Ninevite. I'm not guilty of the things that they're doing. I'm not fighting in some sort of gladiator battle. One thing that I want to tell you that we can see from this text is that God is worthy of our trust. God is not slow in fulfilling his promises. We may think that he's slow in his patience, but the problem is when when we have that issue, it's because we're not actually trusting in the sovereignty of God. So if we truly believe that God is sovereign, then we'll know that he is trustworthy, right? And if we also truly believe that God is good, then we don't have to be afraid of his sovereignty because those things can coexist together in the mighty, perfect God. Jen Wilkins, one of my favorite authors, and I love this quote that she has about the sovereignty of God. She says about mankind, we want our rule. We want our kingdom, our power, our glory. We want the very throne of God, but we are wholly unqualified for it. See, we can trust in God's perfect timing because he is sovereign. We can also trust that he hasn't forgotten his people. He saw the brutality of the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and time and time again, he rescued his people. His word shows us that the oppressed will not be oppressed forever. He is faithful. But I also really resonated with what Nathaniel said a couple of weeks ago when he says that we too quickly align ourselves with either the victim or the oppressor. And I want to remind you that perhaps your role is neither. I mean, I hope that you're not the oppressor right? And I hope as believers and as Christians that we don't view ourselves as the oppressed. Because the problem with either of those views is it's not about you. The story isn't about you. It's about a serious and sovereign God who desires a restored relationship with mankind. It's about God and it's not about us. And when we take the the view off of ourselves and put it on the sovereign God where it belongs, all of a sudden we don't feel like the oppressed, or we're going to walk in obedience instead of be an oppressor. God is worthy of our trust, but he's also worthy of our obedience. I told you earlier that the message that that Nahum had for the people of Nineveh was very inappropriate through the cultural lens. The timing could not have been worse. Um, But he still obeyed and conveyed God's word. He could have argued with God like Jonah did. That didn't go very well. He eventually was obedient anyway. Um, But it didn't seem to fit, right? He could have said, God, there's no way that this is possible. Like, obviously people are going to think I'm stupid and they're not even going to listen. Nahum didn't make these excuses. He was just obedient. Guzik again said, knowing the grace and mercy of God to his people should not make the believer careless in obedience. It should make the believer more careful to obey every word of the Lord. Now, I'm going to go a direction that I don't usually go, so I'm going to confess to you guys. It makes me a little bit uncomfortable. I hate when when people kind of go this way in sermons, and then when God was telling me, like, hey, you need to start saying this, I was like, so I'm just, like, putting this out there. Like, if you get uncomfortable, know that I'm uncomfortable, too. So I went um, on a trip in Europe with my husband a long time ago and went to um, this museum um, in Amsterdam. And um, it was a museum that was, that was going through and looking at um, the victims of World War II, right? And it was tracing through the battle. And it was interesting because, you know, when you go to an American museum, 
we focus on the people, like the individual person. Like we have entire museums and monuments for specific individuals. But what was interesting about this museum is most of the time individuals specifically weren't even named. There was only bits and pieces of their story. You never got the full picture of their story because it was about the collective of their story. And we live in an individualist culture, right? Americans are very individual, like, I'm responsible for me, you're responsible for you, I'm going to do my thing, you're going to do your thing, I'm going to pave my own path, make my own way. I tend to cling to that American perspective. I tend to land in the individual responsibility territory. But something that we can't escape that we see in Nahum is that there is a national application evidenced in scripture that nations will be held account by God. Entire nations will be held to account by God. See, we are our brother's keeper. Now, there's two things I want to make very, very clear here. We can never allow politics to supersede scripture. I don't care what party you're a part of. Scripture must trump everything. We cannot allow convenience to ever supersede obedience. See, there's a national responsibility, and that makes me uncomfortable and it probably makes a lot of you uncomfortable because I like to think that I'm just accountable for myself. But as members of our nation, we are in part responsible for what happens. And especially as part of a democracy. I mean, we have a voice. This isn't about politics or parties. It's about heeding the warnings of Scripture. See, we have an obligation as Christians to make change when and where we can. And not just when it like, comes to us, but to seek ways of making change. Now, I know sometimes I feel like it's a lost cause. But that is not justification for sitting back passively. I'm going to repeat that again. It may sometimes feel like a lost cause, but that is not justification for sitting back passively. I have never found that in Scripture. God never gives us an out for passivity, ever. But not only is there a national responsibility, there is a church responsibility. We're called to be a part of the bride of Christ, a part of the church. Even if you've been hurt by people in the church, welcome to the club. The church is full of broken, sinful people too. But scripture doesn't give us an excuse to forsake gathering together. In fact, it tells us not to forsake gathering together. And it says that we're supposed to encourage each other and we're supposed to gather together in unity. Jesus gave us all a calling to go, to do, to baptize, to preach, to disciple in unity. Those are inescapable commands that he calls us to do, not just to leave to the professionals. So not only is there a national and a church responsibility, but there is an individual responsibility. And you may be thinking, but I have Jesus, so what does that mean for me? Yes, there is grace and there is mercy in Jesus, but God is still just. In Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, it says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can he, we who die to sin still live in it? When you've been given grace, to choose to continue to live in sin is an affront and insult to God, and he doesn't take it lightly. See, that we talked about idolatry mattering to God then, and it still matters to God now. And you might say, I don't have idols. I just don't always put God first. My church, I go to Green Tree, and they're wrapping up this Sunday a sermon series called Idols. And they've talked about the idols of entertainment, relationships, money, and work. See, those are things that we can put before God. The times that we choose that instead of jumping into his word or for gathering together for worship, those things may be good. But when they supersede God in our life, they are no longer good. And we have placed them above God in our life. Idolatry still matters to God and oppression still matters to God. You may think, I don't oppress others. I just don't go out of my way to do anything about the oppression of others. Well, God cares about that too. Cruelty still matters to God. I'm not cruel. Sometimes my sarcasm just goes a little too far. Injustice still matters to God. I'm not unjust. I just don't want to rock the boat. I want to say something very clearly tonight. Apathy can still make you a passive, or passive participant in sin. Just because you choose apathy does not mean that you are not part of actively sinning or passively sinning in these situations. When you see idolatry, oppression, cruelty, injustice, or so many other things that God talks about in Scripture and you choose to do nothing, it's still choosing to do something 
and it's not on the side that God calls us to. But one of the things that I want to end with tonight, and if the worship team wants to go ahead and start coming up, we're almost done. Um, One of the things that I started noticing when I was reading Nahum and I was hearing about how it was so seemingly politically incorrect at the time. He could have waited for the right time, but he didn't. He was obedient when God told him to be obedient. And so I want to ask you, are you waiting for the right time? And that waiting for the right time to have a conversation about Jesus with a friend or to deal with some sin or to get out of your comfort zone to pursue justice or to pursue um, sharing the gospel with others or growing in your faith or taking your faith seriously. Have you let waiting for the right time cause you to sin and to be an act of disobedience for you? It wasn't the right time for Nahum, but it's what God told him to do, so it was the right time, and he still obeyed. See, God is serious, and he is sovereign, and he is worthy of our trust and our obedience. Will you guys pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, um, God, I just want to thank you that you don't change, and that you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God, I want to ask that you um, and your spirit would work in us and show us the areas that we need to repent And that it wouldn't be the temporary repentance like the Ninevites had, um, but that it would be a complete and total repentance leading to life transformation, um, walking in restored relationship with you. And that, God, we wouldn't make justification and excuses for our sin, but that we wouldn't be content with anything less than following and pursuing you with complete and total trust and obedience. It's in the holy name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen.